So if we pick up right where we left off yesterday, I wanted to, to remind you that we call this R the R of closest approach. And I was trying to show you that as you as this guy who I I kind of covered him up with the triangle, but the guy is right here. And he's running, well, not like that. He's running this way. Right? As they get closer, their distance definitely also gets closer. And remember, the R is getting smaller, but the angle is getting bigger. We have shown that they are doing that in the same, per, per, um, to the same percentage is the wrong word, but they are, as they are changing, they keep multiplying to be the same value. And that value is what I call the R of closest approach, also known as R perpendicular, which you're going to see me write a lot. Because one of the things I do want to point out is that this point, the point where the kid jumps on the merry-go-round, they have a velocity in this direction, right? And the radius of the merry-go-round, which is this way, that's the radius. Well, it's got to be perpendicular to the guy as they get right there at the edge. Do you guys see that okay? That's our perpendicular. And it's also called the R of closest approach. You'll notice that in this problem, I never told you how far away the guy started nor what the angle was, and they never will. In a problem like this, and I'm going to redraw it so that we have a, a fresh take on it. In a problem like this, the idea is that you have to advance the kid in your mind from where they start to the point just before they collide with your object. So if they're starting here and they're running towards the edge of the object, you're not going to be told how far away from the merry-go-round they started. You're going to be told it's a 30-kilogram kid traveling at 2 meters per second towards a 200-kilogram merry-go-round that has a radius of, say, 1.5 meters. And then probably something on the order of the kid jumps onto the merry-go-round. And when they do, they and the merry-go-round spin. Right, this is a collision question. And it's a conservation of angular momentum question. And this is what we were talking about yesterday. The merry-go-round does not slide to the right because it's affixed to the ground. There's an external force on the merry-go-round. I want you to be able to explain that because on your first test question, I'm going to have you explain things like this. So I'll probably say, well, what's the direction of the force acting on the merry-go-round when the kid jumps on it? And you'll probably have to say that, well, the ground applies a force to the left because the kid applies a force to the right. And the merry-go-round stays in place. Well, why doesn't the merry-go-round move? Well, because there's a force from the ground on the merry-go-round. Well, why does it spin? Because that force is at the center and can't apply a torque. That's what we talked about yesterday. Those were all the words I used yesterday. You should be able to use all of those words again today. Now, with that, I want to focus on the problem itself. It has all the tenets of a collision. One object touches and becomes attached to another object. Those are the things that we know of that are about a collision. But in this collision, we have an object moving in a straight line first, and then we have this system that's spinning afterwards. You have to recognize that this guy who's running towards the merry-go-round has angular momentum relative to this point. Remember we talked about that yesterday too. We talked about this idea that you connect a line between this point and your object, and you imagine that that line traces their motion. And you can see that that line has the tenets of something that is moving in a circle. Right? That's what we were talking about yesterday. So I want to reiterate, this person has angular momentum. We're going to use the lowercase l for it. And when they jump onto and become attached to the merry-go-round, this system will also have angular momentum. But I'm going to use a capital L for that. We use a lowercase l to denote an object that's moving in a straight line, but has angular momentum relative to some other point. I'll say that again. We use a lowercase l to indicate that an object has angular momentum, 
even though they're moving in a straight line, but they have angular momentum relative to some point. We use capital L to represent objects that have angular momentum because they are spinning. So the two L's are both angular momentum, but they kind of denote different things. Objects that are spinning are going to get the capital L. Objects that are moving in a straight line, we're kind of saying to the universe, we know the object's moving in a straight line, but we also know it's going to do something with that momentum that's going to cause a spin later. So we're going to refer to its angular momentum. We know the kid's about to jump on the merry-go-round, and we know it's because they're jumping on the merry-go-round that the merry-go-round is going to spin. So we're going to formulate a value for their angular momentum related to the merry-go-round. Everybody following this argument? If not, I'll give you a couple of hints. Things that you can do to help determine how and when to use the lowercase l. First, so first, how do you know we're going to use the lowercase l? It's pretty straightforward. If something's going to be spinning due to that object's motion, use the lowercase l. But to use that lowercase l, you should ask yourself some questions. Is there a clear pivot point? In this problem, do you know that there's going to be a clear pivot point? This is not always an easy question to answer. When something's rooted in the ground, that's good. You got a clear pivot point. So in those circumstances, you're good. But if it's not, what if this was like a, uh, like we did yesterday? Remember we had a question, we, we talked about something that's just like floating on top of an a, a ice field or something. You know, it doesn't have a clear pivot point. Sometimes they won't. What if you just had, if you grab a stick and you throw it into the air? Does it have a fixed pivot point? No, but it probably spins. Well, where does those, those objects spin? Objects without a clear pivot point will spin about their center of mass. And I use the word clear there, but I probably should use the word fixed. I'm going to just put CM there for center of mass. So is there a clear pivot point? If there is, great. If there's not, it's their center of mass. You need this because of point number two. What's your object's point of closest approach? You're going to need that. That means advance your object to where it's about to touch the other object. That's how you figure out the point of closest approach. Like I'm saying the kid's just running at the merry-go-round. Well, I know eventually the kid's going to make it to here. That's their point of closest approach. So although I didn't tell you you know, what to use for the kid's angular momentum, you'll have to infer it by knowing where the kid jumps on the merry-go-round. Now, I could have screwed the whole problem up by saying the kid runs this way. Then their point of closest approach is there. Now, that doesn't make any sense as a kid. Do you really think the kid would run right at the center of the ride? I mean, I would hope not. That, that kid's probably not going to enjoy the spinning of the ride as much as the kid who runs towards the edge. Do you guys know that you should run towards the edge? Do you guys ever play with merry-go-rounds? Has anybody ever been on a merry-go-round? Three of you? That's sad. So terribly sad. This is what's wrong with our, with our children today. This is why we're in this predicament. Not enough merry-go-rounds. I think if we had the, the whole courtyard filled with merry-go-rounds and swings and swings... Everybody be so happy. Now, third thing, set up your collision. Which means a before and after case. Once you've identified these things, you can set up your collision. 
a before and after case. So I'm going to start writing those things down because I'm just kind of not interested in it anymore. Get all the words out of the way. Anything that is moving in a straight line is going to get the lowercase l. Anything that's going to spin about a center of mass is going to get the uppercase l. So the before part of the problem, I have a merry-go-round and I have the kid running in a straight line. Two objects. Afterwards, the kid is on the merry-go-round. They're a part of the merry-go-round. So I see one object after the collision. This looks like a perfectly inelastic collision. One, two objects become one object. Moreover, if the merry-go-round is not spinning before the kid jumps on it, it has no momentum before the kid jumps on it. Now, just a reminder, lowercase l, r times p times the sine of the angle. But if you paid attention to my beginning part of the day, or you paid attention yesterday, we're going to use r perpendicular mv. Right? We're going to use the point of closest approach whenever we can. So I'm going to advance that kid just to the point where they're about to jump on, and I'm going to use that as r perpendicular, which sure looks like it's the radius of the ride, doesn't it? So that's what I'm going to use here for their moment. So I'm sorry, for their angular momentum, I'm going to put in 1.5 meters for r perpendicular. Then I'm going to put in their mass, 30 kilograms, and their speed, 2 meters per second. This is the amount of angular momentum the kid has. And, and let me be clear, not only is this the amount of angular momentum the kid has, this is the amount of angular momentum the system has. If there's no external torque on the system, that's how much angular momentum will be in the system. Now, after the kid jumps on the merry-go-round, we've got angular momentum for a spinning object. That's I times omega, as we talked about last week and the week before. I times omega. And because we're not new at this, we know that I here has two parts, right? There's going to be the moment of inertia of the disk, the merry-go-round part plus the moment of the inertia of the child, a point mass at the edge of the merry-go-round part. And that has to equal omega. I think we've got a, a way of solving our problem now, right? I, we can figure out how fast the system is spinning after this collision. Uh, if I say that the merry-go-round is a disk, then that means one-half m r squared. And if I say the child is a point mass, then that means just m r squared all times omega. Now, you guys are doing me a solid by actually acting like you're writing this down. First period, not so much. I look around those people and I see these eyes and they're just like looking off into space. Now, it's nice to know that you guys are writing these things down, but you understand that I spent in first period an enormous amount of time reminding them that these two R's don't say the same thing. And you need to know their difference. Although you have formulas, you guys notoriously just automatically put in the same number for whatever you see there, but you should treat them separately. The R on the left is the size of the disc. The R on the right is where the child lands on the disc. Because I'm going to change that over the course of this problem, and I want you to be aware of that. Now, at the beginning of the problem, they, they are the same number. So, uh, merry-go-round was, what, 200 kilograms? 1.5 meters squared plus the kid, 30 kilograms. And they are 1.5 meters from the edge, squared, all times omega. And this equals, well, whatever 1.5 times 30 times 2 is, which is 90. Now, you guys can do arithmetic. You can find out things. You can punch in numbers. But as I found out in last period, uh, we got five different numbers for this answer. Five different numbers. I was surprised. So I see you all pushing buttons. This might have given me a different answer than what I asked for. Um, so, because everything inside here is 292.5 times omega. So I'm pretty sure omega is going to be about 0.3, right? Like about third. So omega 0.3 or something. Uh, radians per second. All right. So we have our answer now. The kid runs, jumps on it. It's going to spin at 0.3 radians per second. If you want to know how many revolutions per second that is, you can convert that to revolutions per second. But you have an idea of how fast it's spinning. Um, First period said that we hadn't, but I'm pretty sure you could do this next question. What happens if the kid, after they jump on there, walks to the center of the ride? What happens to the moment of inertia if they walk to the center? It gets smaller. What do you think is going to happen to the how fast this thing spins? 
It's going to spin faster. Can you do that problem? We've done this problem before, right? First period said we've never done it, but I'm pretty sure we have. Um, I'd like you to, let's assume the kid walks all the way to the very center, which means they basically disappear because R becomes zero. Right? As the point mass goes, if they're standing at the very center, their value for R becomes zero. Does that make sense? Now, I know you're going to say, well, doesn't their mass add to it? The kid is really small compared to the merry-go-round. So unless they're at the edge, no. When they walk to the center, they don't really have any extension compared to the merry-go-round. So they basically disappear when they're at the center of the merry-go-round. So how fast is the merry-go-round spinning when they make it to the center? Now, based on what I'm looking at, I'm afraid that you guys are going to do something I don't want you to do. So think for just a moment. Let me, uh, let me, let me just help my picture here a little bit. In this new version of the problem, we don't know how fast it's spinning, but now the kid is standing at the very center, right? And we're looking for how fast it's spinning now. Before you launch off for a new problem, do you realize that you already know the angular momentum of the merry-go-round? No. You already know the angular momentum is 90. That doesn't change. You don't have to redo everything. It's going to be 90 equals. Now it's just a moment of inertia of the merry-go-round, which you've already done. Because you already know that that's 225, right? So don't repeat more work than you have to. Once you knew the angular momentum of the system, you didn't have to recalculate it. A lot of people would redo all of this work, but you already know it. The angular momentum stays the same unless something acts on the system to provide an outside torque. So we're good. We're good. Um, I want to do another example. Are we good with this one? We didn't talk it into the ground, but I have another I think you guys should look at. And it's going to just take this and kind of pivot it on its head a bit. We're still looking top down, friction free surface thing, okay? Is that all right with you guys? So we're looking down on like uh, uh, an air track or something. And Sorry to bore you. All right, so here's the situation. We've got a, a puck of some sort. There, a puck at some sort that's like at rest right here, V equals zero. And this thing is spinning or rotating with an angular speed omega, has mass 2m and length d. It strikes the puck and stops moving, but the puck continues with velocity v and mass m. Everybody follow along so far? See what I'm, I'm kind of suggesting? There's a fixed axis of rotation for the stick here. I want you, you, not me, I want you guys to find the velocity in terms of d, m, and omega. Can you do that for me, please? And, and can you do it quickly? Because there's something else I want to do after this. Do you see the collision problem here? Okay, I've done some things in this collision problem to make it easier, like stopping the, the stick from moving after the collision. I'm saying that it transfers all of its momentum over to the puck. See if you can do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a rod spun about one end, so you should know its moment of inertia is one-third ml squared. 
I'll give you a minute. I'm going to call on one of you, and we'll see what we get for an answer. The, the rod is going to swing down, and it's going to strike the puck. So I'm, I'm well, actually, this is, this is it. So um, if we assume, I can't really, like, demonstrate it rotating, but basically, you know, it's going to, oh, that ain't going to work. It's, hmm. Time is of the essence, and I don't want to run out of it. So how about we look at the fact that the only thing moving before the collision is the paddle. And because it's rotating about a fixed pivot point, I'm going to give it a capital L. The puck is not moving before the collision, so it has no angular momentum before the collision. Now, after the collision, the puck is moving, and it's moving in a straight line. But if we want to apply the rules of conservation of momentum, then we have to treat the puck as if it has angular momentum about the pivot point, which means we are looking at the puck as if we are standing here and watching it rotate away from us. You guys following me? So if we're going to apply the rules of conservation of momentum then we're going to treat the puck as if it has angular momentum relative to the pivot point. <coughs> Bless you. Now, lots of little pieces, little details, right? The rod has angular momentum one-third ml squared, which means one-third m is 2m, l is d squared times omega. So L is I omega, but I have to put all the proper things in to calculate the angular momentum correctly. That has to be equal to, all right, for, we're going to use R perpendicular MV. And I say to you that R perpendicular is the length of the rod, right? The point of closest approach for the puck is when it touches the bottom of the rod. Would you agree? Right? Every point after that, it's further away from the axis of rotation. So the closest it ever gets is one distance, one D away from the axis of rotation. So I'm going to write that its angular momentum is D times MV. Are we good? Any question about any of that? Pretty easy? I'm going to solve for V now. Um, that's just algebra. The M's cancel out. One of the D's cancels out. And it looks like V is equal to 2 thirds D omega. Does it, does it make sense that if the bat was spinning faster, the puck would move faster? That seems to make sense. Um, this make, may make less sense, but if the puck is longer, I'm sorry, the bat is longer, the puck moves faster. Now, anybody who plays baseball knows it has to be true. You want to hit the ball in a certain spot of the bat, the sweet spot. Now, there's a range on all bats and where that sweet spot is. But you know that when you choke up on the bat, you're changing that, right? If you, do you guys know what choking up is? Three people do. It's where you hold the handle closer. Go ahead. So if you had, if you choke up on the bat, you have a range, you play it up more, so you have a lesser range for where the ball can be hit. I don't play baseball. Why would a baseball player wish to choke up on the bat? Um, to limit their um, the range of the swing, so you don't have as much of like a drawn out swing. You have more of a clear cut, so you can get to the ball at a faster rate. Easier to rotate the bat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Le changing the moment of inertia of the bat relative to your hands. All right, um, we don't have as much time to finish this next part as I want, but I would normally stop and say, you guys should calculate the kinetic energy of the system before and after. But we're gonna do it real quick together because I need you to see something before the bell rings. The kinetic energy over here is gonna be one half I omega squared, but we already know what I is because it's a rod, so it's one half times one-third times 2m times d squared times omega squared. This is the kinetic energy of the rod just before the collision. 
you clean all that up and you get one third m d squared omega squared, the kinetic energy before. This is a collision. I expect the energy to change because it's a collision. Otherwise, it's an elastic collision. But if you are asked if the collision is elastic, you would have to test the energy. That's what we're doing. We are testing the energy. So the kinetic energy after the collision is one-half mv squared. But this doesn't give us a way of comparing because it's in terms of v. If I want to compare it, then I need to substitute in what I know about v. So one-half m, and then v is three, sorry, two-thirds d omega squared. Well, two-thirds squared is four-ninths. And if I cancel out the half with the four-ninths, I get two-ninths m d squared omega squared. Now, first, let me be honest. I don't think many of you would think to do this substitution. You need to. You need to start thinking about stuff like this. We want to make a comparison that we need to be all in the same numbers and letters and stuff. Next, compare these two. Is energy gained or lost in this collision? Is one-third bigger, smaller, or the same as two-ninths? One-third is bigger than two-ninths. This collision lost energy. What kind of collision is it then? It is an inelastic collision. It lost energy, and I have the proof. All right.